and welcome to the Nonfiction Authors Association webinar series. These webinars are carefully designed to teach you what you need to know about writing, publishing, and promoting your nonfiction books. Whether you're listening live or on one of our social channels like Facebook, YouTube, or Vimeo, turn up the volume, set your monitor to full screen mode, and prepare to immerse yourself in this valuable learning experience. Now on to the webinar. Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar series by the Nonfiction Authors Association. I am Stephanie Chandler, I'm the founder and CEO of the Nonfiction Authors Association and Writers Conference, and I'm your instructor today. And we're talking about steps to take before you write your nonfiction book. And especially for those of you who may be new to writing, or even those of you, I know we have some seasoned writers here today, uh, I think there are some important steps that a lot of writers don't think about before they set out to write their manuscript. So hopefully this will give you some fresh ideas to prepare you for when you write your next manuscript, or maybe you even have one in progress. I have personally authored 11 books. I have an, a handful of manuscripts in process and for various reasons they have sat there for a while uh, but I love the process of writing and I uh, hope that you find this helpful so let's get into our content today so first of all I like to ask writers what are your goals for your book I think this is a really important question that maybe we don't pause to think about. So what do you want your book to accomplish in the world or for you personally? Do you want it to inspire readers? Yesterday we had a member a Zoom call and I asked the question, what does successful publishing mean to you? And overwhelmingly, the answer was to inspire readers and to make a difference in the world, which I think is really exciting. It's the reason that I love nonfiction. I think that we have this opportunity to use our experiences and help other people learn from them, uh, be inspired by them, all of those things. Maybe you're writing your book because you want to leave a legacy. You want to make sure that people know about uh, your story or your experiences. Uh, perhaps you have a business or you want to have a business. A book is a fantastic tool for getting new clients uh, in attracting new uh, business opportunities. Um, I've worked with a financial advisor several years ago, and he wrote a book on financial planning, and he could care less how many copies of the book sell because what he does when he meets with a prospective client is he hands them a copy of his book. Now imagine if you're going out meeting financial advisors and the, the, the pitch is kind of the same, right? With most of them. But then you meet the one that hands you a copy of his or her book. That makes an impression. So maybe that's one of your goals for your book. Maybe you want to establish thought leadership in whatever field that you're in so that you can stand out from others in the field. If you're interested in getting speaking engagements, books certainly help create that credibility that will get you booked to speak at events. If you're aiming to make money from book sales, that's good, but I would say this shouldn't be a primary motivator. Unless you have a massive platform, most authors in general are not going to make a lot of money on books. So you really want to focus, sorry, the cat is the, wanting to be on screen with me. It, you really want to focus on other activities around the book. And the profits are nice, but please don't come into this business hoping that is going to be the ticket to retirement. Uh, and maybe you want to tap into your creativity. Maybe you've always enjoyed writing and you want to take the challenge to do it. Maybe you're don't enjoy writing and you want to see if you can do it. So the creative aspect of writing can be a lot of fun and maybe it's a dream. I spent my whole life wanting to be a writer and I was working in the Silicon Valley. It couldn't have been any further from my dream and left that over 20 years ago, but maybe this is just a, a lifetime goal. 
So whatever your goals are, I really encourage you to think about them because your goals should really dictate the process for producing your book and what it's going to be about. And I recommend that you capture these goals. And in fact, feel free if you want to share them in the chat, share what your goals are for your book and how you want it to impact the world or your business or get you booked for speaking. I think it would be interesting to see what you're all thinking about. So with that, you want to define the why am I writing this book? I want to leave a legacy for my children and their and the future generations of my family. That's a very legitimate reason to write a book. Uh, I want to grow my business. I want to get booked on, for paid speaking engagements. I just want to inspire people to overcome an obstacle or live a better life. So whatever that is, define it and let that be your compass for writing the book. And I encourage you to write it somewhere that you look at it. I, I find this really powerful. So I want this book to be a tool to help me land more speaking engagements, grow my coaching business, and inspire readers to improve their lives. Whatever it is, generally we can have multiple goals. And this is your compass. So next, once we've defined our goals, we want to get really clear about who we're writing for. Please pay attention. This is so important. We want to identify who is the target audience for your book. Is it women 45 to 65? Is it teenagers? Is it men going through divorce? Is it people getting ready to retire? You want to get really specific about who your audience is. Are they in certain professions? Are they people who work in the tech industry? Are they college professors? Are they financial advisors? Uh, what are their hobbies and interests? And what kinds of activities do they do? So these are things to get really clear about and also figure out what events do they attend? What organizations do they belong to? What blogs and websites are they reading? What magazines do they read? What podcasts are they listening to? These are all important details because this is going to factor in, especially when you get to marketing your book. You want to be able to figure out how to reach your target audience and know where they're spending time. This is also how we learn what is interesting to them. And if you take nothing else away from my presentation today, please do this exercise. What are the interests, needs, and challenges of your target audience? What problems does your book solve? Now, for those of you writing memoir and narrative nonfiction, you may not be solving a problem, but you're addressing interests, right? Maybe it's your military memoir, and it's for people who are interested in military history, descendants of veterans. So what are they interested in? What do they want to know? And then the needs and challenges for those of you writing prescriptive or how-to type nonfiction. What solutions does your book bring to your target audience? How does it improve their lives in some way? I really want you to give this some deep thought and spend some time um, brainstorming. One great way to stand out in a very crowded book market, there are some estimates that over a million new books are being released a year. That is incredible. And that means there is a sea of competition in every genre. So how do we stand out? I highly recommend that you carve out a niche. This is my buddy, Carl Polachek. He owned an IT business, a computer consulting business where he helped people and businesses manage their computer networks. So he left and sold that business 20 plus years ago. And he could have gone out in the world and become a general business consultant, but he decided to focus on being a consultant to people who own IT companies. There are not millions of IT companies in the US, right? but there's lots of them. It is a big enough audience that it's also a niche and it helps him stand out. He's written a number of books. 
his managed services in a month is one of the best-selling books in his industry. And it's all about how to manage your IT company. And when you're thinking about a niche, think about how much easier it is to stand out in a smaller field versus a huge field of business consultancy. General, I met a a uh, business consultant at a meeting recently. And I said, oh, what kind of consulting do you do? And he said, well, everything. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to bet your business isn't very busy because you really want to get clear about that target audience and who you're serving. My writer buddy, Bill Ty, is a retired fire captain. And for retirement, he thought it would be fun to write and produce firefighting manuals, but not general firefighting manuals. He focused on wildland firefighting. And this little hobby turned into a six-figure business. So when I said, don't count on profits, when you niche, it's a lot easier to make profits. And it turned into a six-figure annual income that he had never expected by doing something he was passionate about. He established his own publishing company. He learned how to do his own book design. He prints in full color overseas. Uh, it's really a phenomenal success story of somebody who's passionate and carved out a niche. And it led to him teaching, teaching firefighters in South Africa and all around the world doing something he loves. And he eventually decided it was time to really retire after a good 10 years of doing this. And he ultimately sold the rights to his books. So he's leaving a legacy behind. He's reaching a lot of goals and some of them he didn't even realize he had. Liz Abbas is an incredible writer voice for codependency. And her focus is about uh, loving an addict. And she, she wrote a story, her memoir about her brother's addiction. He overdosed 25 years ago. And so she's written this memoir and she's in the process of landing a book deal. But here's the interesting thing about the memoir. The publisher wants it to be prescriptive. So this is a popular buzz term right now in publishing. So if you're writing a memoir and you're not famous and you don't have your own reality show, one great way to stand out is to provide some prescriptive content where at the end of each chapter, maybe you have some exercises or lessons or journaling prompts, something that sets your book apart from everything that's out there. Uh, so Liz sends out a newsletter, I believe it's twice a month. Uh, and what she does is she answers a question in each newsletter. So her readers write in, my brother, um, has struggled for years. I thought he was sober. I watched him suddenly change during a meal. When he drove us home after dinner, he was all over the road. What should I do? And then she writes a response. She starts to write the response in the newsletter. And if you want to keep reading for the full response, you click on the read more and it takes you to her website and her blog. So I love this format. It is simple. It is succinct. It is interesting. It is driving her readers back to her website and it's engaging her readers. They're submitting questions that she's therefore able to answer. So she's carving out a niche for herself in loving someone with addiction and codependency. It's brilliant. So target audience, when we're thinking about carving out a niche, think about the competition, right? So there's lots of financial advice out there. I love that this book is about personal finance for teenagers. What a great gift idea. If you're the author of a personal finance guide for teens and you want to understand what are the reader's interests, needs, and challenges? Maybe there's teenagers that, well, I know there's teenagers that need to learn, excuse the cat again, that need to learn how to budget and learn how to manage money in the real world and use savings and there's so many great ways that you could advise teenagers that they're not learning in school, right? And maybe there's teenagers who want to start a business, they're entrepreneurial, you could have a chapter on that. So understanding your artist audience demographics and their interests, needs, and challenges helps you write a book they want to read. Stephanie Fu, this was a, a really compelling memoir called What My Bones Know. Look at the subtitle. 
a memoir of healing from complex trauma. So who's the target audience for this book? Probably anyone, especially women who've been through complex trauma, are familiar with complex trauma. That is the target audience. So knowing who you're writing for helps inform what it is you're writing, right? So what is your audience interested in a memoir about trauma? They're interested in healing. They're interested in uh, relating to the story. They've been through similar experiences. If you're writing a memoir, if you're writing any kind of narrative nonfiction, what does your audience want to know? What is going to make them uh, want to tell people about the book? That's a really important one too. This is Jenny Levine Fink. She wrote a book called Dear Gluten, It's Not Me, It's You. And what happened for Jenny is she discovered she had a gluten allergy. And this can be a really serious problem for people. And so she launched a community called Good For You Gluten Free. And I love her pop-up. It says, join the 24,000 members of the Good For You Gluten Free community and you get content to help you live your best gluten-free life. She shares articles, recipes, gluten tests, gluten-free food giveaways because she has sponsors. So she built this community by sharing her story, sharing what she's learned. And then her book came out. So the community came first and she learned a lot about what they're interested in. And then she went and wrote her memoir. And what happens when you've cultivated an audience and you know what they care about, the book comes out and it sells really well as a result of that. So what does Jenny's audience care about? They care about how to find gluten hidden in their foods, how to read packaging, how to find recipes their whole family will enjoy. There's lots of interest needs and challenges for this audience. Do you see where I'm going with this repetitive interest needs and challenges? So when you start thinking about your target audience and hopefully carving out a niche for yourself, you want to make sure the audience is large enough. So I mentioned my friend Carl Polachuk and he teaches IT business owners how to grow their businesses um, is that a big enough audience? It turns out it is. And in a smaller community like that, he's a real standout. They don't have a lot of leaders in that community, but you don't want it to be so small that there are only a hundred readers in the world that want to read your book. And is it narrow enough? So are you talking about how to start a small business or are you talking about how to start a clothing consignment store? Right. So how can you narrow that down? Years ago, my very first book was a business startup guide. This was 20 years ago. Now, back then, there was a lot less competition than there is today. If I were doing that today, I would never write a general guide like that. I would have focused on how to start a consulting business, how to start an online business. I would have narrowed that focus down in order to stand out. The other question to ask yourself is, how am I going to reach these people? So when you get clear about who your audience is, are they reachable? Is it an audience that you can find? Can you figure out where they're spending their time, what blogs they're reading, who else they follow, who are similar authors? Because if you can't reach them, that creates a huge problem. And I went through this myself in launching our community, the Nonfiction Writers Conference, I started back in 2010 as an online event because I was speaking at writers' conferences and I was so disappointed in the fact that so few actually had content specific to nonfiction writers. So I started this conference and I didn't know if anyone would attend, but I had to figure out where does my audience spend time? So are they in other writers' groups? A little bit. But generally, most writers groups are talking to fiction writers. So it turns out my audience is made up of coaches and consultants and professors and people with professional backgrounds and physicians and attorneys and therapists. I bet I'm speaking to many of you as I say these things. So it tends to be a lot of professionals and there's not one easy place to go find these people. So it is a challenge but it's also a niche. 
right? The writing community, I could have started yet another writer's group, but I started one specifically for nonfiction. I saw a need and I filled it. So if you can find a need in a target audience, even better. So knowing your audience, we want to define who are they? Get really clear about the demographics, the age range, the education level, who is your audience? Where are they spending time? What conferences are they attending? So in my own case, that's something where I want to go speak, not necessarily at writers events as much anymore as consulting conferences for professional speakers. These are folks writing nonfiction books where the regular kind of writers conferences and small writers groups I'll be lucky if 10% of the attendees are in my niche or writing nonfiction. So where does your audience spend time? This is such an important question because you're going to want to be able to reach them. And if I haven't said it enough, what are their interests, needs, and challenges? Please challenge yourself to do this as an exercise. And if you don't know the answers to these questions, ask. Start asking your readers your potential readers, your audience, something that I find really helpful because I engage with the nonfiction community every day. It is what I do. And I'm going to take questions at the end of this session. And I take note of questions and I have a, a mission to answer every question with a piece of content, because I know if you have the question, someone else has it too. So when I take questions from our audience or when people send in their questions, uh, I either write a blog post about it, it becomes a report, it becomes a podcast episode. So this is all content that helps me better understand my audience and directly speak to your interests, needs, and challenges. You're here today because you had an interest in writing a nonfiction book, and I'm trying to help you overcome some of those challenges. So how do you serve your audience? And this is really where the rubber hits the road, right? I am attempting to serve you today by addressing your interest needs and challenges as part of my target demographic. So once you understand your audience, how will your book serve them? Next up, we want to craft a book description. Yes, I want you to write this before you sit down to write your book. Writing the description helps you speak directly to your target audience because we're writing sales copy. We're helping the target reader be engaged and interested in this book. What makes your book interesting and readable? Right. And so I encourage you to go read book descriptions, especially by New York Times bestselling books. Those tend to have the best descriptions and poetic writers like Roxane Gay. These are great descriptions to read for examples. The descriptions are going to be different if you're writing narrative nonfiction versus how to prescriptive nonfiction. So when you're writing prescriptive you're talking about the benefits. How is the reader's life going to be improved in some way by reading this book? And with a narrative, with a memoir, you're telling a story. You're hooking them into the story by summarizing what it's about, but in a really compelling way. And we are writing this for our target audience. How would you write a description of your book that captures the interest of your target audience and makes them want to buy the book. So thinking about your book description, generally we're looking at three or four paragraphs at most for prescriptive nonfiction. I like to see bullets, an opening paragraph, a list of benefits for the reader, and generally a closing paragraph. I encourage you to go read some of these as well. I'm not going to read all of them to you, but um, some great examples, Atomic Habits by James Clear. No matter your goals, Atomic Habits offers a proven framework for improving every day. James Clear, one of the world's leading experts on habit formation, reveals practical strategies that will teach you exactly how to form good habits, break bad ones, and master the tiny behaviors that lead to remarkable results. 
I mean, that's just a single paragraph and it is phenomenal. It totally conveys the benefits. So even better, if you can encapsulate it in a very short paragraph and be able to describe your book to people like this, that is incredibly valuable. So he's also got bullets. So after that phenomenal paragraph, learn how to make time for new habits, overcome a lack of motivation or willpower, design your environment to make success easier, get back on track when you fall off course. These are all challenges of his target reader. Such a great description. And then the closing paragraph, Atomic Habits will reshape the way you think about progress and success and give you the tools and strategies you need to transform your habits. Whether you are a team looking to win a championship, an organization hoping to redefine an industry, or simply an individual who wishes to quit smoking, lose weight, reduce stress, or achieve any other goal. So good. This is a really fascinating memoir, by the way, by Patrick Gagne called Sociopath. I think it's on the, the New York Times list right now. Uh, she is a diagnosed sociopath and writes about her entire journey starting in childhood. It's a fascinating read if you're interested in human behavior. That's one of my interests. So I'm not going to read everything, but let me just open this. Patrick Gagne realized she made others uncomfortable before she started kindergarten. Something about her caused people to react in a way she didn't understand. I mean, it loops you right in. Like, what does that mean? Tell me more. It is so captivating, right? Uh, she did her best to pretend she was like everyone else, but the constant pressure to conform to a society she knew rejected anyone like her was unbearable. So Patrick stole. She lied. She was occasionally violent. This is so interesting. So this tells her story in an encapsulated description that makes you want to go follow this journey with her. Great description. And so it, it, this is the inspiring story of her journey to change her fate and how she managed to build a life full of love and hope. That's the end of uh, Patrick Gagne's description. Uh, another great description, The Glass Castle, is truly astonishing. A memoir permeated by the intense love of a peculiar but loyal family. So readers of familial sagas will enjoy this book. That's what that tells me. Uh, if you're writing a prescriptive book, we want a call to action. This book will show you exactly what it takes to lose 30 pounds in 30 days. So don't waste another moment. Obviously, I'm not telling you to create outlandish claims, but you want to get people excited about how the book is going to transform their lives. So your book description, ideally, you've got your opening paragraph. If it's prescriptive, you have some bullets. What is the reader going to take away? And then a compelling closing paragraph. So our prescriptive is going to be benefits reader narrative. You're going to demonstrate the storytelling. You really want that description to be lyrical. And go read the description of some of your favorite books uh, in your genre and outside of your genre to kind of get a feel for the tone and how book descriptions are written. Because this description, along with identifying your target audience uh, and your goals, is going to help you chart the course for what your book is going to be about. It doesn't mean this stays the book description. As you're writing, you might find that your book is going to change course a little bit, but it does give you a great starting point to focus on and understand your target audience because you're writing this for them. So that helps you shape your manuscript for them. So I'm going to take your questions, but I want to give you some homework. All right. So clarify your goals. What is your why? Why are you writing this book? See if you can carve out a niche audience for yourself and then learn what are their interests, needs, and challenges. What do they want to know? How can you entertain them? How can you improve their lives in some way? Write your book description and then your manuscript should serve those interests, needs, and challenges. Now, after that, your next steps, which we're not going to get into today because I want to take your questions, but next up, you're going to craft a, a unique and compelling title and by the way, with titles, we don't want to duplicate what someone else has already done. There's research involved. 
Same thing with understanding the competition in your field. What other books exist in your space? How is yours going to be different or better than those books? And how can you make your book stand out so that it doesn't look like everything else? And then, of course, there's the process of developing an outline. So these would all be your next steps. This is all stuff I cover in our writing course. But hopefully you're going to take away these next steps. Do this as homework. I am going to share the recording and slides. So you will get that later today and be able to do this as homework that I hope you find really helpful in guiding your process of writing your next manuscript. So I would love to take your questions. Please pop them in the Q&A. And if in the Q&A box, I should say, it's hard for me to filter through chat. So put them in the Q&A. And then if we can take just a moment, I would like to just introduce you to the course we have that's starting next week. What we've just done is a bit of a preview into what we'll be covering in our Write Your Nonfiction Book Manuscript in 90 Days course. It starts next Thursday and it's 14 weeks long. Week one, we're going to be talking about the foundation before you write some of the things we talked about today. We'll also cover evaluating your competition, choosing the best topic um, to align with your goals. Next, we're going to talk about book fundamentals, keywords, brainstorming titles, writing that compelling book description and sharing that among the students in the course. The week three, we're going to talk about planning the manuscript, the elements, the statistics, the stories you're going to tell, and how to create a thorough outline. This makes it so much easier to write, I promise you. We do have some writing week breaks so that you're focused on your writing and we're connecting through our private Facebook group for students only. And then we're going to talk about editing options and understanding how editors, I'm not an editor, but how editors make our writing better. And there's different types of editing. So we'll talk about that. We also have a lecture on traditional publishing, how to get a book deal. We have another writing week break. Then we have self-publishing and hybrid publishing overview. Then we have some holiday breaks. And then we have beta readers. We're going to talk about how to leverage beta readers for feedback and support when you're writing. We're going to talk about marketing basics. And then on our 14th week, we're going to do a big share and a discussion and celebration. So this is an interactive online course. I am going to do this with you. So when I set out to put this course together, I taught it this summer in New York at the Omega Institute, a, a shorter version of it. And it was so much fun. And I thought as I'm putting this together, I really should do this with everyone. So I'm going to, to get out a manuscript idea that I've been sitting on for far too long. I would love for you to do this with me. We're going to have a private Facebook group with accountability, but there is no pressure. We're going to set weekly writing goals. If you don't meet them, that's okay. I may not meet all of my weekly goals. I get it. We're all busy. We're just going to do our best, but we're going to have exercises and handouts and prompts, lectures. And I really expect we're all going to make great friendships as a result of this. Uh, I've already seen our attendee list so far. It's really impressive. Some people doing incredible work in the world. So I'm very excited to see this cohort thrive together. So I'd love to do this with you. The course is $6.97. If you're a member of the association, you get 33% off all of our courses, or you can join when you sign up and you get the member rate. There's also a three pay option. You don't have to pay it all at once. And we had a promotion running where if you signed up early for the course, I would mail you a copy of the nonfiction book marketing and launch plan. So for our webinar audience, if you didn't take advantage of that early promotion, if you sign up in the next 24 hours, I will personally sign and mail you a copy of our 230 page workbook called the nonfiction book marketing and launch plan. So I'd love to have you join me. You can go to write nonfictioncourse.com. That will route you to our page. You can also find it over at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com. And I would love to see you there. So let's take your questions. We're going to stop the share. And here we are, Q&A. All right. What if you're writing about a best-selling author 
is that a built-in target audience? Oh, that's an interesting question, Blair. So it sounds like you're telling the story of another author, if I'm understanding that correctly. That is a very interesting audience. And to a point, that is a built-in audience because you're targeting people who are fans of that particular author. So the question is how you reach them. What do they care about? What do they want to know? Right. So if I'm reading a, a memoir about someone I admire, I want to know the 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 nitty gritty. I want to know where they grew up. I want to know what they struggled with. I want to know those things. So yeah, I think that's a really interesting built-in target audience. Becky, is self-publication reasonable for a nonfiction newbie? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the vast majority are going to self-publish today. It is no secret. It's harder to get a book deal than ever before. However, just getting a book in print is only 10% of the process. Getting readers is a whole other ballgame. And it's all part of the marketing piece of it. But yeah, most new writers are generally going to self-publish, especially if you don't yet have much of a platform. I started out self-publishing and then built my audience and went on to land a book deal and an agent and sold several more books. So it's absolutely a great path. Laura, I have a very compelling personal story that I'm trying to write in service to others, which makes it prescriptive. Can you share examples of memoirs or narrative nonfiction that are prescriptive, which you consider can't hurt me in this category? I did not fully read Can't Hurt Me, but I believe that is in the category. And this is much more common. And there are books that kind of look like prescriptive. Gretchen Rubin's Happiness Project comes to mind. I mean, it was her own journey, but it, it had a kind of a prescriptive element to it. So off the top of my head, I don't know any, uh, Jenny Levine thinks Good For You Gluten Free is, is a prescriptive memoir. Looking up prescriptive memoir will probably net you a bunch of examples, but really it can be as simple as telling your story. And then at the end of each chapter, having some lessons and some actions for the reader to take. And it definitely helps um, sell books today. Uh, Lily, my book could be about my view of what aging feels like on a personal level. My target audience would be women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who are curious about aging process and want to re prepare for what lies ahead. They might be seeking an understanding of what their mothers are going through or what they themselves can expect in the future. Yeah, Lily, that's interesting. I think that you could narrow that focus a little bit. I think there's probably quite a few books in this space on aging. And it is certainly something that a lot of women are interested in. I wouldn't say all women are. And I guess the my question would be, is that more about the physical process of aging? Is it about the emotional process of aging? Is it about embracing aging? Is it about, you see where I'm going with that? So how could you narrow that down a little bit? and get really clear. I'll be honest, in my 30s, I wasn't thinking about it in all, at all. In my 40s, I panicked. And now I'm in my 50s and wishing I thought about it in my 30s. I would definitely flesh that out a little bit, but I think it's a great topic. What would be the best type for this book, prescriptive or narrative? So Lily, that's where competitive research comes in. And we didn't cover that today, but Understanding what books are already in that space is very important. How many memoirs are there on aging and how many prescriptive books are there on aging and how can you make yours different than what's already available? You don't want to write the same book. So that's a really important piece of research to do before you start writing. Joanne, I'm writing a series of blog posts to start connecting with my personal social network. Does that make sense? Yes, Joanne. Bravo. I am a huge fan of content marketing. That's what you're doing. I really recommend from a marketing perspective that all of us as nonfiction writers have at least one piece of foundational content. And by that, I mean a blog, a podcast, or a video channel, or you may have a combination, but at least one of those, a blog, a podcast, or a video channel. 
and you start producing content to engage your target audience. And that's the content you share on social media, you put in your newsletter and things like that. So yes, it's great. You're blogging, make sure your blog content speaks to the needs, interests, and challenges of your target audience. Very important. Deborah, best marketing tactics for self-publishers who have already reached their social networks and blog audience. Uh, Deborah, can you elaborate on that? I'm not sure. Are you looking for new, different marketing ideas? I'm a big fan of podcast interviews for authors. This is a huge underutilized opportunity. So there are probably millions of podcasts at this point, and many of them have a niche focus. So it might be the niche focus is on how to sell on eBay, how to be a better single parent, how to run a consulting business, whatever it is, podcasters need guests. So as an author and an expert, you can pitch yourself as a guest on these podcasts. And it's a great way to connect with more people. I hope that answers. If not, please feel free to clarify. JP, writing a historical review with footnotes and bibliography seems somewhat academic. Is that reasonable considering I'm not actually in the academic space? I love this question. Yes, of course it's reasonable. And this is where um, editors come in. I think editing is really important. Again, I'm no editor. I think I'm a decent writer, but editors make me better, right? You know, writing in an academic space, and if you're not necessarily an academic, you certainly have some sort of credentials. And being able to cite sources also brings a lot of credibility. If you think about the way journalists write stories or articles, they're citing sources. They're telling you um, where they got this information. And so you're calling information and putting it together. You absolutely uh, should be doing that. It's perfect. Becky, with all the bad actors in social media now, what safety actions could I take to expand my current network? Social media safety is a big thing. Uh, you don't want to be clicking on links that people send you or engaging with people that could potentially be spammers. You want to limit the personal information that you share. Don't announce that you're heading out on vacation. I see this so often. Don't post from vacation either. Post when you get back from vacation. That is how I do it. It's sharing photos of young kids, mentioning what school they go to. I'm a, a honor roll parent at at Joe Schmo, you know, elementary is not a good choice. Those are some of the things I, I think we should be changing our passwords and studies are showing we want long, complicated passwords. So those are some of the things. I am not a cyber uh, security expert, but those are some of the things that I personally um, take into account with my own social media and not necessarily letting people know where you are all the time, stuff like that. Uh, Deborah, if you're not a known author, it can be difficult to reach beyond the people who know you already. Looking for ideas to expand my reach of already published books. Yeah, Deborah. So I mentioned podcasts. I think that's one great way. Another one is what I call your community of influence. It's the people that you know. So the people that you know can actually help you with book promotion. For example, maybe it's past coworkers, people that you went to school with. Uh, it could be the parents at uh, uh, your kid's school. It could be members of an organization that you belong to or a nonprofit. And could you ask them to bring you in as a speaker to buy your books in a, a bulk uh, capacity? Could you ask them to introduce you to somebody who runs a podcast? So I do this exercise myself every time I release a book. I sit down and I make a spreadsheet of the people that I know, and I have a column called ask. What am I asking? It might be as simple as asking them to write a review on Amazon, but it might also be have me as a guest on their podcast, share it with their social media networks, publish an excerpt in their blog. So you might be surprised it's when you sit down and do this exercise. I will go through my emails, look through my social media, I've been in this industry a long time. I forget that I've got lots of friends that date back. So going through that exercise is really helpful. 
And then also sending out review copies. Who are the influencers in your field? Can you send them a copy? Can you get interviewed by them on their video channel or in their blog or on their podcast? So those are some of my favorite tactics for growing that audience. And then content marketing, have that foundational piece of content, whether it be a blog, a podcast, or a video channel, and start sharing that. If you are serving your audience by addressing their interests, needs, and challenges, your content is going to draw them in and get them to sign up for your email newsletter. I hope that helps. Candace says, I've been making a collection of essays of my experiences and illustrations of my travels around the world, which I hope appeal to women traveling solo. I'm unsure of genre as it wants to be a coffee table book. So that's interesting, Candace. I think I would do a little bit of competitive research and see what's out there. Talk to your audience. You know, what do solo women travelers, which by the way, I think is a really great target audience. What do they want? Do they want to put someone else's photos and essays on their coffee table? It might actually be a book that you read while you're traveling, or maybe you include some journal pages or travel tips. I would do some research before you commit to that as your idea. You want to make sure it is serving the interests, needs, and challenges of your audience. I, I, we should have had that dollar for every time I said that statement, right? <laughs> Dorothy, where does one look to start identifying readers of memoir and what their needs are? Dorothy, go look at similar memoirs, memoirs with similar stories. Now, Keep in mind with memoir, every memoir should essentially be about overcoming something, right? And memoir is a period in time. So it's not a biography. If you want to tell your whole life story, that's not a memoir. That's a biography. A memoir is a period in time that has a specific theme. Cheryl Strayed comes to mind. Her memoir, Wild from lost to found on the Pacific Crest Trail, such a great title, right? And it was about the loss of her mother and making peace with the mistakes she's made and peace with the loss of her mother. So there is a thread there that appealed to any woman struggling with loss and self-identity. So you want to figure out what is the theme of your memoir and find similar books and find the audience who is reading those books. Uh, Rod, title is Out of the Presence of the Jury, Narrative Nonfiction, True Crime, may not fall into standard categories. Told in first person, a unique perspective. Okay, this is a lot. The jury didn't get, um, is there a question here, Rod? I'm not sure. Can you follow that with a question? Let me know how I can help. Uh, Nancy, how focused is the course on memoir? It, it's both, Nancy. So uh, we're covering both prescriptive and memoir. 90% of it is the same, right? So there's a 10% difference between the two, and we will be covering those differences and how to plan for them, where to place your stories, how to organize that outline, all of those details. Did we get them all? Did we get all the questions? I, I hope that was helpful. I enjoyed this very much. I hope this gave you some new things to think about and that you're all going to go on and write really compelling books for a very specific target audience. I promise you it helps so much on the back end when you're trying to market and get readers. You want to know who they are and what they care about. So thank you all so much for spending your time with me. Oh, a couple snuck in. Do I need permission to write about an author, Blair? That is a legal question. Uh, you, are, in general, we have the right to free speech and, and talking about things that are public knowledge. So you couldn't tell that author's personal secrets or defame them in any way, but I would encourage you to talk to a literary attorney about that. All right, everyone, I will send out the slides and the recording this afternoon. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. I enjoyed this so much. Good luck with your writing and I hope to see you in class. Bye everybody. Thanks for listening to this webinar hosted by the Nonfiction Authors Association. Members enjoy full access to replays of all of our educational webinars and many other benefits. 
Not a member yet? Think about it. We offer tremendous support, guidance, educational resources, courses, free reports, and a welcoming community for you, wherever you are in your writing and publishing process. We also produce the annual Nonfiction Writers Conference, offered entirely online since 2010. Find out more about the NFAA and how to join at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com.